So as we come to John 12, we'll just read the verses that we are, well, maybe just in case some weren't here, uh, we'll go back to read from uh, verse 31. John 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Now if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. How sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory, and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come, a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Amen. Ending a reading. There, the end of the chapter. Let's still our hearts momentarily, that the Lord will graciously come to our silent and yet sincere cry that he will uh, come and be with us here tonight. Lord, you know the need of every heart, and as they silently wait before thee with a desire, I know that many, if not all, there have, they have this desire that you would come and hallow this hour, and that the time spent in the Word of God would be profitable and would come with application to them, and that they would see the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ, and also all that they need to understand about their own hearts. We ask, Lord, that you'll give that heavenly application, that the Lord himself by the Spirit will come and fill this preacher, and the word will come forth direct and appropriately to everyone before us. For again, Lord, we confess, without thee we can do nothing. And so fill us with power, with divine wisdom, and with the love of Jesus Christ, and that we would preach the word as it ought to be preached. So help us to see the Lord. And again, if there be any here not saved, O oh God, it is thy work to save. And we pray that you will do that saving work in their lives and in their hearts, even at the close of this year. So bless us and be with us, and grant that there would be the destruction of the enemy and the extension of the kingdom of Christ. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There will be always people who portray certain elements of the Christian faith and yet who do not truly know Christ in their heart. If that has not got across to you as we have progressed through John's gospel, then you have not been listening at all. James writes in James 2.19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The idea James is getting across there is that you cannot boast in the mere profession that you believe in God. Theism 
is not sufficient, nor is deism sufficient uh, to uh, bring us to a proper understanding of salvation and what the true and living God has provided in His Son, Jesus Christ. We saw last time that some had a certain amount of faith in Jesus. There's, first of all, the general crowd who were rejoicing in the welcome of the Messiah coming into Jerusalem, and they come in, and they seem to be keen to exalt him and look to him uh, that he would deliver them from the Romans and so on. And then when he begins to speak and outline more of what really is in his mind and what is uh, on the schedule before him that it isn't to come and uh, rule and be king on the earth and to destroy the Roman Empire and so on, but that his intention is to die, then they begin to turn. And whenever element of assent they had given, and that's all it was, it was like a mental assent that they see him, potentially this is our Messiah, let's make much of him, but as his vision of what is ahead as he begins to reveal what is intended in the plan of God for this Messiah. Uh, they don't like that plan. They would rather he would do what they want them to do uh, than what he is saying he's going to do. Here he is saying he's going to die. And we said last week that they seem to understand that because when they say in verse 34, uh, we have heard out of the law out of the Old Testament Scriptures, that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And in their mind, there seems to be what you're saying, as the Son of Man, a Messianic title, we are seeing you as Messiah, but you're saying you're going to be lifted up. But we understand the Word says that Messiah abides forever. And I said to you that that seems to give away the fact they understood His language. Because he is saying he's going to die. We know that because it tells us in parenthesis in verse 33, this he said, signifying what death he should die. But they understood it as well. Because essentially by his death, he's going away. They understand the law to say Christ abideth forever. So it doesn't match up. They are confused. And they don't like what they're hearing. But Jesus goes on, appeals to them to walk in the light. To, to, to the, 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 the light is still with you a little while. Walk while you have the light and so on and gives a warning to them, uh, which is again a pains of his Messiahship, them to come and believe in him as the true Messiah, since light and the fact that he is Messiah are very much uh, synonymous in the prophecy of Isaiah. And so then he departs, it tells us in verse 36, these things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Then after he talks about the fact we shouldn't be surprised at the rejection of Israel toward Christ uh, because of what the prophet Isaiah has said, we skip on down to verse 42 where it says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. And we, we get again the hope that perhaps there's genuine faith here. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So they're afraid of excommunication, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And again, we said to you, that is ample evidence. They do not truly know Christ savingly. They don't. They don't compare to Peter, James, and John and the rest of the apostles who had counted the cost and had left their nets and followed the Lord and were prepared to uh, not follow the crowd. I mean, that becomes clear at the end of John 6 when everyone goes away and Peter says, to whom else can we go? We have no one to go to. If we leave you, then there's no hope for us at all. So they, uh, they, they did, had no value upon the praise of men. They didn't care for the praise of men because they truly knew the Lord. But these individuals who had, again, an understanding, this man does seem to be the Messiah, but they are afraid. And their elevation, or as we put it last week, their idolatry of men is not compatible with saving faith. And that comes as a challenge again that I want to underline. If we are professing to believe in Jesus Christ tonight, that we are followers of him, when we are afraid to own him, then it is evidence on the side that we don't truly know the Lord. And Jesus made that plain, that if we do not honor him, we will not receive honor, we will not be accepted of him. But if we acknowledge him and own him, then he will make sure to own us before our Father, which is in heaven. And so, this is the case. Men may have some element of belief, and yet they don't know the Lord. And that is something I am confronted with every time I step into this pulpit, 
the reality of those before me who may say the right things, do the right things, confess the right creeds, uh, and, and just give uh, an appearance of knowing the Lord, yet there always is a danger that you've never truly been saved. Now, I don't know what you're like in your private life. I don't know how you walk with the Lord, nor do you really know uh, the in, innermost details of my life either. And this is always the problem in the church. There's no way of purifying the church so it's full of just believers. There always is the potential. Indeed, I think in any church that's properly functioning, there always will be present those who are not saved. And they need to come to truly know the Lord. We also made this argument because of John 5, 44, that they didn't, weren't truly saved because of that expression the Lord made very plain there. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? If you are like that, you can't believe, essentially. I'm not going to go back into all of that again. But then we come to these verses that we're looking at this evening, the closing verses from verse 44 to the end of the chapter, where it appears at first look that Jesus is preaching again. And we said last week that this appeal, in verse 36, it ends in verse 36, that that's the end. Christ closes his public ministry. The rest of his teaching will be to his people, to his disciples, all that comes in John 13, 14, 15, 16. Uh, all of that will come. But this here, this is his closing appeal. But when we read verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth in me, we wonder it well. What's going on here? Has he come out of the darkness, come back to preach another sermon? What is going on? Well, uh, I don't think that is the case. Um, the commentators I read uh, would agree. There, are, there is some difference, but mostly there is a consensus, at least among those that we would respect. One commentator puts it like this, uh, from verse 44 onwards, this is not meant to relate uh, a reappearance of Jesus in public. The close of his public ministry is noted in John 12, 36, it is in continuation of the evangelist's own remarks and introduces a summary of Jesus' past teaching to the Jews, end quote. Others agree. John Wesley in his note says, this which follows to the end of the chapter is with St. John the epilogue of our Lord's public discourses and a kind of recapitulation of them, end quote. Lenski, another commentator, says John might have closed the first half of his gospel with verse 43. He adds another paragraph in which he combines previous utterances of Jesus and fashions them into a brief summary of Jesus' call and testimony to his nation, end quote. And then Philip Schaff in his commentary says the same thing. The only supposition when he looks at all the the details, he says, the only supposition, therefore, is that the passage contains an epitome or summary of the words of Jesus to the Jews. And I believe they're right. I think that's what's happening here, that verses 44 to the end are really a kind of a summation of all that Jesus has been saying. And we will try to see that as we go on, at least not in full detail, but to some degree, uh, see the reminders that are pre present in these verses of all that the Lord has taught us prior to this. Thus, in this passage, John is less concerned with the time and place of these words and more interested in summarizing Christ's general appeals to men throughout his ministry. It's as if John is saying, here's what Jesus was constantly crying out to Israel. And so that's what we have here before we move into the time where he deals largely, uh, exclusively with his disciples. So tonight, as we look at these verses, very simply we've entitled it, A Summation of the Savior's Message to Sinners. A Summation of the Savior's Message to Sinners. Good way, perhaps, to close out the year uh, in the providence of God and look at these verses and just uh, go down through them and consider what the Lord is saying to us. The first thing we might note is the need to see Christ. The need to see Christ. This is clear through this gospel. The, 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 the constant appeals of the Lord to see him, and it comes clear here in verses 44 through 46. Jesus cried. Again, this is a word that's not often used but it has been used. We had it in John 7, where he cries at that last great day of the feast, that, that the, 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 if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Well, here is that same kind of lifting up his voice, raising his voice to be heard. And it, it seems as if John is laying out here that Christ was constantly raising up his voice to the nation of Israel and saying these things. 
Jesus Christ was not going around hiding his message, his call to repentance, the, the call for them to believe in him. He was not trying to make it hidden. He was trying to openly profess who he truly was and make them see it and call them to belief in him. So verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And then he goes on and says, He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. The idea in verse 44, lest it should be misunderstood, uh, where he says that uh, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, <laughs> but on him that sent me. Clearly the Lord's not saying here that to believe in me is not to believe in me. <laughs> That's not the case at all. The point he is getting across is he who believes in me doesn't only believe in me. He also believes in the Father. And this has been, again, a strong emphasis of the message and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that you cannot have a dichotomy here where you say, I believe in God, but I reject Jesus Christ. Or I love the Lord Jesus Christ, but I don't like God, whoever God might be in their mind. There cannot be a, a, a division, a dichotomy, a splitting of this. Jesus is saying here, verse 44, look at it. He that believeth in me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. It's not just on me he believes in, but also in the one who sent me. And again, this is largely applicable to the Jewish nation. And they're saying constantly, we have the Father, we're followers of God, and they're their expressions of faith, that, and yet rejecting the Lord Jesus. And Jesus says, no, cannot be, because the opposite, the same is true, that if you don't believe in me, it's not just me you don't believe in, you don't believe also in the one that sent me. If you go back to John chapter 5, just to refresh your memory from, I suppose, just over a year ago, in John 5 verse 24, where he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth in him that sent me hath everlasting life. So there is the same idea. There is hearing my word and believing on him that sent me. They're synonymous. And I could go on down through John 5. Uh, really, John 5 is, is the, uh, the, the kind of the fullest expression of the unity of the Father and the Son. It's not exclusive, but is the fullest expression of the unity that exists between the Father and the Son, where, again, if you look at verse 19, for example, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what, the, what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. The Son does exactly what the Father does. Impossible, unless he is God. There's a unity of work here between the Father and the Son. And so, Right through John 5, uh, there is this constant language that expresses, men and women, that you cannot divide them. You can't be like the Jews and say, well, we trust in the Father, but we don't trust in you. And the Lord deals with that in various places, uh, such as uh, John chapter 8, when he says very plainly to them, when they are uh, arguing, uh, we'll read from verse 41 of John Eight, for example, ye do the deeds of your father, right? That's what Jesus says to them. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, ye would love me. And the point is made clear, not just here, but on down through these verses. You can't divide the two. You cannot do that. It's impossible. So we ought not to. We ought to realize that what Jesus is expressing here is what he's been expressing everywhere. And John is, as we say, summarizing his general message. He that believeth in me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Now, the, the idea of seeing him, and this is what we say, the need to see Christ. Uh, there is this real need to see him, because if we don't see him, we don't see God. That's the point. And this is what he then has to deal with his own disciples about. We'll get to that in John chapter 14, whenever uh, he expresses in these familiar words of John 14 verse 5, where Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If he had known me, he should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. 
Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? And you see what the Lord does here. He says, show us the Father. And Jesus says, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't seem to know me, Philip. Because if you, if you really knew me, then you wouldn't be asking this question. This, you wouldn't express this desire, show us the Father. <laughs> you would have seen the Father. Because when you see me, you see the Father. Beloved, this is so important to get this. And I know that it's fundamental and elementary to many of you here tonight. But if we ever get away from this, we have strayed from biblical Christianity into heresy. We must see that Christ is the expression of God. And when we see him, we see the Father. And there can be no division. This is why if men are to know God, they must see Jesus Christ. Uh, just for one example of uh, the, where the, we have in the New Testament the the fullness of Jesus Christ represented and how he is God uh, and, all that it can, and all that can be expressed. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, uh, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. The express image of his person. I mean, you think of that. How can anyone be the express image of anyone else <laughs> unless they are that person? And when we were dealing with God, it would be blasphemy to consider anyone to give a true expression of God who was not also God himself. Jesus Christ, therefore, is God, and when we see him, we see the Father. That is what he is saying. And of course, we need to see him, but the question might say, well, I'm living 2,000 years down the road. I can't see Jesus. I mean, if I could see Jesus, then I would believe in God. But clearly the language of the Lord Jesus is spiritual language, spiritual sight that he is referring to. Otherwise, none of us here could be saved. It would be an impossibility for you to be saved if you have to see physically Jesus Christ. No man can be saved. And so the, the emphasis of Jesus here is to, to truly see him. He that seeth me truly sees me. That's why he really is reprimanding Philip later on where he's like, have, you not, have I been so long? Do you not see me, Philip? Do you not see who I am? Are you lacking that spiritual perception? This is what we need. This is what all men need, true spiritual sight, the ability to truly see the Lord Jesus. And when we see him, there is no quibble then about the fact he is God. You never need to convince a Christian that Jesus Christ is God. You don't. If you get into the realm of really having to convince them, like really they're fighting against it, it may be they'll come and say, you know, show me in the scripture where it's revealed and they want to see it in the scripture and they will submit to it when they see it. And that, that's fine. There's no problem there. But it's whenever there's a resistance and a complete lack of perception and a denial of it. You can't be a Christian. And so we cannot throw any form of Arianism, as it's classically known, the Russellites who come to your door, the JWs, when they come, they're not Christian. And one of the things that's kind of interesting here in Canada versus uh, back in Northern Ireland is, is how uh, much less, uh, how much more ambiguous they are here about who they really are. In, in Northern Ireland, if the, if the Russellites come to your door, they will be very explicit and clear about who they are and they will be ready to kind of debate with you and if you tell them that you're, you're a Christian or you're born again, then they will be ready with answers and so on. But they will also avoid you too. But if you use the term Christian, you, you apply it in the term of being uh, like born again, they won't identify with you. They won't. But whenever they come here, according to my wife's experience recently, they came and she was saying, I am a Christian, and I, I'm, I don't believe what you believe, whatever. And oh, we're Christians as well. And they're trying to align themselves 
with you here as, as, as if, I suppose it's the Canadian afraid to offend anyone. And it's kind of so, the pluralism is so dominant that even the cults don't want to be uh, kind of separate or different anymore. Um, but that's not the case there. So, but we have to be aware they're not Christian. If, if, if they come to your door and say we're Christians as well, you, have to, you could tell you're not a Christian. You're deluded. You're not a Christian. And then as we said, go back to John 12 here. Read them Isaiah 6. Read them John 12 and show them. Ask them the question, who did Isaiah see? Because John says that that Lord, that Jehovah, is Jesus Christ. They're not Christian. We must see Jesus Christ with true spiritual sight and understanding. We need to see him because if we can't see him, we can't be saved. And so he elaborates more in verse 46. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Still in the same idea of having to see vision, light, in contrast with darkness. Light comes to dispel the darkness, as we are well aware. And Jesus, this is really Jesus' way of saying what Paul declares in the familiar language of 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That when you know Christ, there's a distinct change. In the words of Jesus, he says, Whosoever believeth in me should not abide, remain in darkness. You can't stay in darkness. A transition occurs. A change occurs. If someone truly knows Christ, they don't stay in darkness. They don't. It's impossible. It cannot be. Now again, there's degrees of deliverance. And there are degrees of light. And we see that in John 14, when Philip's struggling to truly grasp all that Jesus has been teaching. But at the same time, beloved, there must be some transference, some moving away from the darkness to the light if we profess to know Christ. There has to be. If I am professing to know Christ, I'm saying I am in the light. But if I am standing in the light and everything I love is over in the darkness, there's a problem. We are called to the light to walk as Jesus invited them to in verse 36, to be the children of light. That their natural habitat would become the light. That's what he means by children of light. If you're the child of something, that's the habitat. That's, that's your nature, what you are drawn towards. And so that's what he is wanting men to experience through his saving grace. And yet we are not like him, are we? If we look at verse 36 where he says that ye may be the children of light, that is not the same where Jesus says in verse 46, I am come a light into the world, is it? No man ever comes a light into the world. No, he comes, according to Paul, we are children of wrath, even as others. But Jesus Christ did not come like other men. Indeed, the language of verse 46, I am come a light into the world, what's that telling us about his pre-existence? That it's real. That he existed before he came. And even as you're sitting around thinking perhaps with family and many minds are drawn toward the babe in the manger and uh, there in the cradle and all around Bethlehem and so on, we must remember that is not the beginning of his existence. It's the beginning of his human existence. But it's not the beginning of the existence of the Son of God. He existed before. He has come a light into the world. He has come the pre-existent eternal Son of God. And we must affirm that as well. We must affirm that Jesus Christ in his deity is eternal. He is equivalent to the Father in that regard. There is no difference. He has come a light into the world. That whosoever believed in me should not abide in darkness. We need to see him, don't we? And you need to see him. Let me say to the believers here tonight, you need to see him all the time. You will know, you will see a pattern in your Christian life. And part of this may even, uh, this is a struggle I have, and a battle I must face too. 
that you will be struggling more if you're not seeing the Lord Jesus. Now, part of that's your own responsibility, but part of it, I feel my own duty as well to make sure you're seeing Christ when you come here. Now, if you come, and this is a congregation where people come and you're walking through those doors every Lord's Day or any other occasion, you're saying, we would see Jesus. He will not disappoint. He will not. But there's always that thought in my mind of the people seeing the Lord because you will know, you will know when you're regularly missing Him and not seeing Him that your heart will be cold. It will. And the constant tonic to a cold heart, the tonic we need regularly to keep us from backsliding is to see Jesus. And I don't mean just theological perceptions and being able to assent intellectually to who he is. I mean fresh visions of Christ where you read the Word or where you're having the Word expounded to you and you're seeing the Lord and you're seeing the cross and you're seeing His suffering and you're seeing His glory and you're seeing all that He has done for you and you're seeing it and your heart is being melted in fresh affection toward Him. There's such a need for us to see the Lord Jesus if you had a simple prayer for me, it would be, Lord, help him to preach so that we see Jesus. He gets up to preach the word that people see Jesus. So the need to see him. There's also the need to hear him. Verses 47 and 48. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Again here in verse 47, where he is calling them to hear his words. The Jews thought that when Messiah would come, that he would judge all their enemies, that basically all non-Jewish people would come under judgment, and he would judge not just the Roman Empire, but every other nation that they felt was against them, which was pretty much every non-Jewish nation. And so he was, they were hoping for Christ coming and conquering, setting up his kingdom and destroying all these other lands and bringing them to subjection to his authority. And so that's what they're looking for. But Christ in several places is recorded, uh, as John has recorded it anyway, that his first coming was not to judge. And that's what he says here again, what's expressed here by John. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now he's not denying the fact that he will one day judge, but he's saying that his initial coming wasn't to judge. That's in contrast with what the Jews were expecting. They were wanting Messiah to come and judge. Messiah come and judge. But they, Jesus saying, I didn't come to judge. You've misunderstood entirely my purpose of coming. Of course, we are familiar with this, I am sure. In John chapter 3, what does Jesus make very plain after he has dealt with Nicodemus? In John 3, 17, God sent not his son into the world to condemn or judge, as sometimes it is translated. He didn't send him into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him, not, believeth on him, on him is not condemned or not judged, but he that believeth not is condemned already, already judged, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And what the Lord is saying very simply is, I didn't come to judge, I came to save. And that the judgment is carrying on while I'm here because the judgment essentially is how you receive me. There won't be a judgment upon you directly. That day will come. But what you do in this life will determine how you will be judged. And while you remain in unbelief, the judgment hangs upon you 
waiting to be meted out on that day. Again, John 5 is full of language like this as well. And again, reveals that he will judge one day. He will judge at the last day. He is the one appointed to be the judge. But right now, and what John is saying is that the, the message of Christ to the Jews was a constant reminder, I haven't come to judge. So they were getting it wrong in two ways, we might put it this way, to summarize. You think I've come to judge. You're wrong, I haven't come to judge. Secondly, you think I've come to judge the nations. I haven't. I've come to save the nations, or as it's put here, save the world. And that's what Christ came to do. I haven't come to judge, and I haven't come to judge the world. I've come to save, and not just the Jewish nation. I've come to save the world. That is the purpose for my coming. So that's what he's saying. Right here, verse 47. It's a summation of all that he's been saying throughout this gospel. And we ought to be familiar with it. Those who have been following ought to be familiar with this kind of language. What the Lord has been saying repeatedly. And in verse 48, when he says, He that rejecteth me, that's a word that John has never used before. And so we look at this language and we find it's not that common in the New Testament. It's found a number of times, but John's never used it. And it says, he that rejecteth me. And it's a strong word. And elsewhere in the New Testament, we find it used by Mark. In Mark chapter 7, verse 9, it says, Full well, he's speaking to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. And when you see that text, and there are other, another one I'll turn to in just a moment, but you realize that how this word is used, is used in the sense of, not rejecting something because you lack information, but you're rejecting it in willful desire to reject. You don't want to believe. And when never Mark saying, full well ye reject the commandment of God, you know you reject the commandment of God. Full well you know it in order to keep the traditions. You know that's what you're doing. You're fully aware that's what you're doing, but you won't admit it. So that kind of rejection is this blatant, outright, obstinate rejection that will just turn a blind eye. No one is as blind as a man who refuses to see. And they refuse to see. It is also language that's found, and if we turn over to it, in Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10 and verse 16. We maybe give a little context here because I think that will help. The Lord has been pronouncing language of judgment upon various cities that have again rejected him. And if we, you maybe can look from verse 13, verse 12. I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. That's the one who doesn't accept the gospel when you bring it in to them. Um, that's what he's been saying. So he says, woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. He that heareth you, heareth me. As we sang to the disciples, you go to hear the, preach the gospel. If they hear you, they're hearing me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. And the word there, despise, is reject. If they reject you, they reject me. And the rejection he is talking about is that obstinate, they will not believe. They refuse to believe. And so you see the kind of condemnation that he presents about Capernaum and other cities where they are graced with the gospel. And the Lord sends his messengers in to preach. And they're to go there to heal the sick, preach the kingdom of God, and so on and so forth. And if they refuse to believe, if they reject the gospel, it will be worse for them than it was for Sodom. Or that it will be for Sodom in the last day. I don't think people get this. <laughs> I don't think that when we preach that people before us, at least for the most part, I don't think we get that we are so familiar with the gospel. So familiar.
We cannot see that it is developing for us a greater judgment than we can even imagine. Sodom is set up as an example. Peter uses it as an example along with Noah. He says this is an example we're to learn from this. And yet Jesus has made it clear here, other parts of the Gospels record the same, that there'll be cities, and the point is the, the people in the cities, who have had Gospel preachers come through and they were obstinate in the rejection and unbelief, he says, your judgment will be worse. This answers the question, doesn't it, of course, about are there degrees of suffering in eternity for those who don't know Christ? And there are. Clearly. If the day is going to be worse for some than for others, clearly the Lord and His judgment is dealing with sin by degrees and will judge and will pour out more judgment, more torment, more punishment upon those who are worthy of more punishment. And there is, seems to be, according to the revelation of God's word, there is no greater sin than to reject the gospel. <laughs> no greater sin. And you can name all the sins. And you can say, that's an awful thing that I heard in the news this week. I can't believe someone would do that. And the Lord would say, you don't realize your sin. You sit in church week after week. You grow up in a religious environment. You hear the gospel. You're so familiar with it. Oh, you're so familiar. And you don't see the wrath of God hanging on you. A wrath far heavier than on any person in this city who has nothing like the privileges you enjoy. So it's the same language the Lord used here in John chapter 12. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. And you'll see again what he said about, <laughs> you say, well, I'm not rejecting him, I'm rejecting you. But you receive what we read back in Luke 10. If they don't receive you, it's because they don't receive me. So it's very simple. God sends you a preacher. <laughs> He stands before you, preaches the word, tries his best to make God's truth plain and how it applies to you and what you're to do. And we do our best, beloved. But any rejection of plain, revealed truth isn't rejecting me, it's rejecting him. That's what he says. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The word that I have spoken. My truth will judge him. There's different ways, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. But essentially, that day of judgment will be a judgment of our lives in light of what Jesus has said. He is the incarnate word. And we will be judged according to truth. And he is truth incarnate. So it won't be some obscure thing. We'll get there and we'll, we'll see what we're being compared to something we don't understand. That's not the way it's going to be. Well, I didn't know that's what you expected. No. The word that I have spoken, that's what will judge you. In other words, the light that I have given, the truth that I have presented, that's what will judge you. At the last day. Isn't that interesting? The last day. It's the last day of the year. <laughs> but there will be a last of the last days. Some of us, if not all, will enter into 2017. Perhaps we'll be here, all of us, this time next year. If God is gracious enough to preserve us. But for every one of us, there comes a last day. And for every one of us, there comes a last of the last days. There comes a final day that is beyond the last day we live and the date they put on our obituary. There's a day of judgment. 
a day where we're called to account. He will judge then. He will. There must be a love then for his words. Would we not say that? Conclude that? The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him. Well, if his word's going to judge me, then I should have some value about his word, shouldn't I? I mean, that's the implication, I think, of his language. And we ask ourselves the question, do I really love the language and words of the Lord Jesus? Do I? Do I? And some, again, just to make it clear, I don't want to assume anything. But they will have a love for Jesus Christ. They will say, I love Jesus Christ, especially this time of year. But then you tell them some of the things Jesus actually said and taught and expected of his followers. I don't take that. Those parts of the Bible, I don't think, you know, they were fine for another day. We live in the 21st century. Things are different now. And they would set it aside. And yet the mark of a true believer <laughs> is what he does with the words of Jesus Christ. I want to show that again. The very explicit language. I mean, I love the way Jesus evangelized John 8. <laughs> we if we evangelized like this, people would say, oh, you're, you know, you're not a very effective evangelist. John chapter 8, verse 30. <laughs> As he spake these words, many believed on him. As he preaches, many believe. Verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Sign a little card, then you know you'll be saved forever. Just keep it in your Bible and you'll know. You've walked the, the aisle, you, you've, you've professed faith. On this date, you ask Jesus into your heart. Everything's fine. Is that what Jesus says? No. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. If. If. What we do with the words of Jesus Christ is critical. It has eternal consequences. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. That brings us thirdly and finally to the need to obey Christ. The need to obey Christ. Verses 49 and 50. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Language that's familiar with other parts of John's gospel, that Jesus is disseminating the message of the Father. That there's a, there's a, a unity of thought in the Godhead. And as the Father in the economy of the Trinity, as the Father gives out the message, through the Son comes one singular message. And so everywhere he went, everything he did was declaring the truth that was given to him by the Father, showing the unity in the Trinity. He was not speaking his own words merely. He wasn't a maverick in that regard. And furthermore, this that he has been revealing more lots in John's gospel was, was a mark of his messiahship. It was. The fact that he would not just speak his own words, but the words of one, the one that sent him, was a mark of the messiah. And that's why it's repeated over and over again in John's gospel, because he's revealing his messiahship. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, where we have a messianic a prophecy from Moses, or in the day of Moses, where the Lord promises, in that verse, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, he'll be like Moses in that way, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So as Jesus went about, and he's saying this, I'm not speaking of myself, I'm speaking of the one who sent me, his words of what I'm saying, that has been it's summarized here in these last two verses of this chapter, but you'll be aware it's been said many times 
in John's gospel. I'm just saying what I've been said, sent to do and whatever. I'm just that. It's a mark of the Messiah. One of the greatest messianic texts known by the Jews in all the Old Testament scriptures. Deuteronomy 18.18 18, made it plain that when he comes, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So we are called to obey Christ. We must. To obey, as he puts it here, give me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. What's the commandment? I think the idea here is to believe. That is the primary commandment. It's the whole theme of John's gospel, believe in the Son. Believe in the Son. And that's the commandment, to go and tell men to believe on him. We must believe. If you're here tonight and you do not believe, you're not saved. You're not ready for heaven. You will die and go to hell. John 6, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. What's the work of God? What's the purpose of God? That you believe on him whom he hath sent. That's the whole work, to believe on the Son that was sent by the Father. Chapter 60, verse 40, This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him, you see the similar language, as what we're dealing with in John 12, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You must see the Son and believe on him. That is the will of him that sent me. That's his purpose. And the same it was whenever he was dealing with Lazarus and about to raise him in John 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Believe in me. That's the commandment. <laughs> that is the commandment. That is what he's saying here. We must believe. Because look at verse 50. I know that his commandment is life everlasting. His commandment is life everlasting. How do you get life everlasting? By obeying the commandment. Believe. Believe. Believe in the Son. And make him Lord of your life. And stop trifling with sin and excusing yourself. Believe in the Son. That is the commandment. That is the commandment. So do you believe? As we have dealt with this passage, summation of all, really, the language of Jesus throughout his public ministry, as recorded by John, do you get it? And they like to satisfy themselves with a belief in God, as we began. We said that. I believe in God. But it's not sufficient, men and women. It is not sufficient to believe in God. It's not sufficient to sing the carols and to go to church on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning or whatever. It's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. There must be a heart change. There must be a reception of all of his words, of all of his person. There must be a real resting in him and a loving of him and a giving yourself to him. Not at the end of every year, the end of December, but all the time. There must be a putting of our sin on him. There must be a seeing of the cross in its full light of what its purpose was. There he is dying for me. And throwing our sin there and then saying because he died for me, I must live for him. I must. We must believe in him. The Lord said plainly in John 8, 42, If God were your father, you would love me. Say that again. If God were your father, you would love me. If you know God... You must love Jesus Christ. If you don't love Jesus Christ, you don't know God. So, do you know yourself a sinner in need of a savior? Do you, do you realize the need to come to Christ? Again, I make no, I may have grounds to presume, but I will not presume that the, every face I am looking on from this pulpit tonight, that you are ready. 
And I call each one of you to repentance, to faith in Christ, to give your heart to him. You say, you know, preacher, I'm not sure, actually. I'm not sure. At times I think I'm saved. At times I don't know. Then you come and bring your heart afresh to him. Whatever you did in the past, don't worry so much about that. Don't, don't hinge eternity on a past experience. Hinge it on what you're doing tonight as you hear the word. What are you doing now as you hear the word? What will you do when you're called to repent, to rest in Christ, to love him, to obey him? What are you doing now? Now. That's what matters. I trust that each one of us here tonight, as we end this year, in this house, we all truly know Christ. And we enter into the new year with full assurance of faith and saying, I know 2017 will not be perfect, but I will be, as God gives me grace, a follower of Jesus Christ, no matter what anyone else may think or say. May the Lord give us all grace. Let's bow together in prayer.